The lost tribes of Israel? Were they lost? Really? I'm David Brett, here with special guest Roger Norman, bringing you Revealing the Truth, a special Revealing the Truth in that we're looking uh, specifically at the lost uh, tribes of Israel. And we've gone through a couple programs already. This is the third in installment of four. Uh, Roger, uh, I'll go ahead and let you lead us into this one. Thank you, David. Next, let's take a look at the Scythians and Parthia. Who were these folks? Scythians lived in southern, uh, Russian, uh, su su southern Russia area above the Black Sea. And the uh, Parthians uh, started out down here in modern day Iran. Tamara Rice, historian, that the Scythians did not become a recognizable national entity before the 8th century BC. Assyrian documents place their appearance in the time of King Sargon. We've heard of him before, a date which co closely corresponds with that of the establishment of the first group of Scythians in southern Russia. Well, this is the exact time that uh, the Israelites were migrating from their homeland, so to speak, time to get out of Dodge, and the time that the remaining Israelites in, of the northern ten were removed as captives. The Greek story of the Xenophon mentions the Scythians and that they suffered very severely at the hands of the Assyrians. That's what we would expect. And a Roman writer Pliny stated that they, that they also descended from slaves. Well, that's what we would expect if they descended from slavery in Egypt, which our forefathers did. The Golden Deer of Eurasia, a book you can buy at the State Her uh, Hermitage in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia has an interesting comment speaking about the confederations of Sumerians and Scythians. And according to some views, the uh, Sumerians and Scythians were primarily the same nomads, their names simply reflecting the area that they came from. I submit they were identical, the Sumer Sumerians and Scythians. Keep that in mind as we look at the rest of this presentation. Anne Christensen, writing for the Royal Danish Academy of Sciences and Letters. Not a bunch of dummies, these folks know what they're doing. Concludes in her book, the Sumerians were in fact identical with the Israelites deported from, the northern, from northern Israel after the fall of Samaria in 722 BC. That pins it down. Colonel J.C. Goller, British government official doing Queen Elizabeth's uh, reign, cites uh, uh, sources as proof that many refugees from the ten tribes migrated through Armenia to, be, to the region north of the Black Sea to become known as Scythians. Second Estrus, an apocryphal book. These are the ten tribes that in the days of King Hosea, Hosea that was their last king, uh, were carried away beyond the river. But they formed this plan among themselves to leave the heathen population, that is escape, and to go to a more distant region so that there perhaps they might keep their statutes, which they did not keep in their own country. Sounds like they were beginning to learn their lesson. Historian Eldad, writing to Spanish Jews, many of the people did not go into captivity, but evaded the calamity, going off with their own flocks and turning nomads, in that the chief of whom they had could uh, appoint or muster 120,000 horsemen and 100,000 footmen. That's practically a 250,000 man army. They probably were escorting uh, at least uh, two million people migrating up through there. Stephen Collins, these Israelites who fled to the Black Sea area came to be known by the Greeks as Scythians or Sake, who did not exhibit evidence of Baal worship. In fact, they were known for the wise laws and avoidance of swine's flesh. Now let's keep this name of Isaac in mind. So shall my name be named on in them, you remember? It's pronounced Itzak, with an emphasis on that sock, and you will see that sake or sock appearing time and again. Tamara Rice, 
The uh, Scythians had cowboys who excelled in lassoing. They had wagon trains. We'll see that trait coming later. Here's something interesting. The word Sith comes from a root word meaning to cut. And the Hebrew word for covenant means literally to cut. Flavius Josephus, this military commander and a Pharisee and a historian of the first century A.D., writing about 800 years after their migrations and final captivity, states, there are but two tribes in Asia and Europe subject to the Romans. He's speaking there of Judah and of Benjamin. While the ten tribes are beyond Euphrates till now, and they and are an immense multitude, not to be estimated by numbers. Beyond Euphrates, here is the land of uh, Israel right here. The Euphrates rivers flows here. That puts them up here in the land of the old Median Empire and above into the uh, southern Russia where the Scythians were. Scythian culture, let's look at that. They were grain exporters. 600,000 bushels of corn per year to Athens. They had the blessings of abundant grain that was spoken by uh, Isaac upon Jacob. They had the wealth, their wealth and fi love of finery won them the goodwill of the Hellenic uh, uh, merchants there in Greece. Herodias writes that the uh, Black Sea area contains, except for the uh, uh, Scythians, the stupidest nations in the world. Well, hey, uh, Scythians had the blessings. They were not stupid. For example, look at that uh, g pure gold uh, cover for an arrow uh, con uh, container that was found in one of their graves. Look at the uh, intricate uh, design work on that. Beautiful. There are some of their uh, uh, pottery, uh, gold inlaid. And by the way, you ever wonder where Amazon woman comes from? They had the Amazon woman. That's it right there. More of their beautiful pottery. How would you like to have that golden comb found in one of their graves? But you might ask, what about 1 Chronicles 35? About 621 B.C. is um, when that period covers. And the children, and it reads in uh, the Bible that uh, the children of Israel that were present kept the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, none like it in all those days of Josiah. And all Judah and Israel that were present. In other words, Israel was present with Judah when it's uh, celebrating the Passover. But we'd heard earlier that Yahweh had removed them all. None were left. Well, what's happened here? A lot of people don't realize that. In about 624 B.C., about three years before this, there was a massive invasion of Assyria by their former uh, captives and uh, uh, folks they'd run out of Dodge, so to speak, and that was the Scythians who came down and occupied the Holy Land and much of the area. But they only stayed there 28 years, history records, and then they went back to their homeland. Parthians. After Assyria fell and the invading Scythians withdrew back to the southern Russia area, then the eastern Scythians took advantage of the power vacuum, uh, vacuum left by Assyria and uh, migrated to the east of the Caspian Sea. Tamara Rice records that there they blended with who? With their kinsmen to form an ethnic group from which the Parthians were to spring some 300 years later. Who were these Parthians? George Rawlinson, there was always in the world, speaking of the Roman Empire world, a second power which in a true sense balanced Rome, acted as a check against Rome. This power was Parthia. A Greek historian, the Parthians had passed from the dominion of the Assyrians to that of the Medes to a similar position under the per Persians, and of course we know later under the Greeks. That's exactly what we would expect of these Israelites who were de uh, deported and who uh, migrated into that area. The greatest extent of their empire covers this area right here, which is directly east of uh, the land of Israel, Judah. So you now know where the wise men from the east came from. And there's their moder the modern day countries that they occupied right here, even going up into part of Turkey. In, in effect, they occupied the old Median Empire, the Parthia did, after they expanded their empire. They had a common origin with the Scythians. George Rawlinson said that the, the ancient writers assert in no uncertain terms that the manners of the Parthians had much that was Scythic in them. Their language was half Scythic, half Median. 
They armed themselves in the Scythic fashion. They were Scythic in descent, in habits, and in character. Their alphabet was based on the Aramaic. The Parthian word for city, the Hebrew word for city. The Parthian word for king, the Hebrew word for king. The Britannica, the great peculiarity of the language is that though it is Iranian, that's the area they were occupying, Iran, it is full of Semitic words. Their coins clearly depict their kings as having Caucasian features and contain the Hebrew word for king, Malik. Let me ask you, these Parthian tomb emblems, do they look Caucasian to you? Especially notice the beautiful hair design on the woman on the right. Parthian culture. Language, Josephus records that he originally wrote his War of the Jews in the Semitic term so that the peoples of Parthia could understand his writings. They had a coordinated lunar and solar calendar. The tribe of Ephraim, well, uh, the Bible records in Numbers 26 that Ephraim had uh, uh, three clans, one of whom was the Aronites and the Tehranites. And there were a group of Aronites there in Parthia. Now you know where Aran gets its name and their capital Tehran gets its name. Covenant Kingdom. It was common practice to uh, uh, flip the B and the P sound, so you take the P out of Parthia, put a B there, and you've got Parthia, i.e. the Covenant people, the BRT. Scrupulous observers of the pledged word, uncommon back then, faithfully eminent, uh, eminently faithful to their treaty obligations. The name Isaac, Sock, was very important uh, and very popular among them. A lot of people don't realize this. They defeated the Roman general Crassus. They killed him. And Mark Anthony uh, almost killed him. They had Magi. They had a bicameral legislator, two, two house legislature. They had a feudal system that we'll see carried over into Europe. They elected their kings, uncommon for those days. Impeached kings would go to Scythia for refuge. That's where their kinfolks were. Armament, they uh, were expert with, expert with the bow and the arrow. They had knights with chainmail armament. Talked about there in the Bible, too. Here is a uh, Parthian clay sculpture in the Turkmenistan uh, Museum. And let me ask you, does that trooper look to be Caucasian? I think there's no doubt about it. The fall of Parthia. Historian B Benjamin, in his 1888 book, Persia, records that their, their then king looked to the occult for guidance and was told Parthia's empire was about to end. This is an echo of King Saul, who sought the occult guidance, which led to his defeat and death. And that's a symptom of moral, internal uh, decay that will bring you down. The fall of Parthia. 220 A.D., the Persian province within Parthia, uh, Parthia revolted. 226, 227, Persians win. Parthia is then forced to migrate and to flee. Well, where did they go? When one of the greatest empires in the world collapses, and millions of, it people, of its people migrate elsewhere, where could they go? They could not go to the east, invading Orientals, south, desert and sea, west, the Archimede Rome. That left their kinsmen to the north, west, the Scythians. We'll be right back after this. If you're confused about the so-called contradictions in Scripture, then you need this magazine, YAIY Beacon. In it, we explain how mankind has blended mythology, sun deity worship, and biblical truth to create false religions. Let us introduce you to Yahweh, our Heavenly Father. His Son's name is Yahshua, who taught us how to pray to Yahweh, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The name of Yahweh is clearly written in the Hebrew manuscripts, but has been purposely hidden in the Greek, Latin, and English translations of Scripture for over 2,000 years due to man's traditions. If you are searching for a scriptural insight, then contact us at yaiy.org. We at Yahweh's Assembly in Yahshua are ready to help you worship our Heavenly Father in spirit and in truth, His spirit and in His truth. May Yahweh bless you. For a free copy of the YAIY Beacon Magazine, write to YAIY 2963 County Road 233, Kingdom City, Missouri. 65262. Visit our website at yaiy.org or call us toll free at 1 877 642 4101. 
We're here with special guest Roger Norman looking at the lost tribes of Israel and some of the history and migrations thereof. Uh, Roger. Thank you again, David. Let's now consider these Gothic tribes. Who were they and where did they come from? The fall of Parthia, we discussed earlier, occurred in 226, 227 AD, effectively ending the Parthian Empire. The Parthians were then forced to flee the Persians. The migration began again about 226, 227 AD. Lucian Musset in his book about the uh, Germanic invasions says about 230 AD, the Goths are found to have settled northwest of the Black Sea, that's our Scythian area, and they were strongly influenced by the former Iranian inhabitants of the country. The Goths, he continues, took to wearing coats of mail, and in the case of the kings at least, Iranian costumes to such an extent that the Greek or uh, Roman authors frequently confused them with Scythians. Well, duh, as pointed out by author Stephen Collins, that's a smoking gun. The Parthians came from modern day Iran with their costumes of, and mail, coats of mail and our Iranian clothing. The Parthian Empire collapsed in 226 AD. They show up only four years later uh, in the land of their kinsmen. It is simply common sense that the Parthians, after migrating to a new land, became known as Goths. The Romans called them Gite, Gothae, and Goths. The Romans mistook them for Scythians. And it's easy to see how the Greeks and Romans would confuse them with the Scythians. They were kinsmen. They passed through the Caucasus Mountains and their descendants became known as Caucasians. Again, the Caucasus Mountains being right here between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea as as they are leaving uh, Parthia, migrating up to the land of their kinsfolk, kinsmen there in uh, Scythia. Tamara Rice, fleeing Goth spread the Scythian Sarmat Sarmatian style through central and southern Europe as early as 220 to 300 AD. The Goths, in effect, taking their style of their Scythian styles with them. John Mitchell. All Europe has been peopled by the Sumerians, and there's that group from the northern Israel again, are Scythians from the borders of the Black Sea. Sharon Turner, 1836, the Anglo-Saxons, Scots, Normans, etc., have all sprung from that great fountain of the human race which we have distinguished by the terms Scythian, German, Germanic tribes, or Gothic. At this point in history, the terms Parthian and Scythian disappear as they take on the new names of Goths, Germans, Teutons, and their names uh, and other names when they invade Europe to take Europe from their arch enemies, the Romans. Here's something interesting. The Asian Sake become known as the European Sox sons, sons of Isaac. And here are grave clothes taken from a Scythian grave. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, folks labeled him as the golden man of Isak. Isn't that interesting? Common language. The Goths, Germans, and Saxons are sometimes collectively called Teutonic people. And look what the Encyclopedia Britannica has to say about this. There is little doubt that in the first century, all the Teutonic people could understand one another's speech, even though there must have been some differences in the dialect, uh, which grew uh, wider as time went on. The old Teutonic speech developed into the different languages which we call English, German, Dutch, etc. Asia's Germanae become Europe's Germans. A historian Pliny wrote that the Scythians, and they can, uh, had a subtribe known as Germanae, has, uh, the name has altogether been transferred to the Germans. Let's look at their cultural links, the Parthians and Scythians with medieval and modern Europe. Edward Gibbons, in writing about the Parthian system, said it exhibited under different names a lively image of the feudal system, which has since prevailed in Europe. They had bicameral legislative houses, again, by uh, two-party uh, houses of government. They uh, had an armed cavalry, armed horses and riders with long lances, forerunners of the armed knights of the feudal system in Europe. Historian Rawlinson, 
They, the Parthians, acquired by use of their bow a fame like that which the English archers obtained with the same weapon. I submit they were indeed the same peoples. Tamara Rice again, the fleeting uh, Goths spread the Sitho style of art through Central and Southern Europe. Of course they would. Scythians became known as Goths. They take their art with them. The Scots knew something in, 18, uh, in 1320, their so-called Declaration of Independence, Declaration of Arbroth, states in so many words that we know that our ancestors uh, journeyed from Greater Scythia, and uh, thence they came about 1,200 years after the people of Israel crossed uh, the Red Sea. They knew back then who their ancestors were. So, where are they today? Let's look at Ephraim and Manasseh, the two birthright, major birthright tribes. Joseph was their forefather. His dream, his brothers would bow before him. So we can expect Ephraim and Manasseh to have other countries in effect bowing to them. He was forgiving and merciful, magnanimous towards former enemies. The birthright blessings he acquired. And, and we want to look for a name meaning man of the covenant, Brit, covenant man. And that, gracious, that nation is Great Britain, the Brit-ish. Brit, covenant, ish, Hebrew for man. The very name spells out their covenant, man. They be one of the prophecies, you'll become a multitude of nations. Indeed, Great Britain did become a commonwealth of nation. As with Parthia, today's Ephraim, the British, aggressively expanded their empire. Now here's a little side track we'll go down here. In Hebrews 1, it reads that Elohim, after he, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and, many, uh, and the prophets, uh, in many portions and in many ways, as in these latter days spoken to us by his uh, son. Well, here's a little indirect thing that I find interesting. Big Ben, uh, famous there in London, that is English and Hebrew together for literally meaning big son or big builder, i.e. big, English, Ben, Hebrew word for son or for builder, i.e. builder of nations. And can you go to the bank on that one? No, but hey, I thought it was interesting. The Brits also possess uh, the gates of their enemies, i.e. the Iberian Peninsula, controlling uh, the Straits of Gibraltar since 1704. Basically, you ought to have their permission to go through. Commonalities with its brother Manasseh speak the same language, Although the Scythians and Parthians were split geographically in Asia, they were, as per historian Rice, a people who spoke the same language and were linked by some sort of racial tie. Well, they would come to the aid of each other and yet they'd fight with each other from time to time. And you'll see that is Manasseh and Ephraim in our modern day. Nations would bow down to them, be leading nations. Other commonalities. Uh, in thee all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Joseph was a great organizer regarding that uh, plague that hit and, uh, and the lack of food. He had to be. Well, that's been picked up by his descendants. Grain exporters, his descendants are. Merciful and generous, rebuilding conquered enemies. Manasseh and Ephraim have. Well, hey, here's a little side track too. Why is Genesis 12, 5 through 6 in your Bible? Why did the author of Scripture go to the detail he did in these verses? Now, Gilead is on the eastern side of the um, Jordan River. It was a land occupied by the half-tribe of Manasseh and Gad. The Ephraimites, their cousins, invaded the land when they got upset with them about a battle, uh, matter. And there was a big battle, and 142,000 Ephraimites fell. They died uh, in that battle as a result of what? Well, they evidently changed into their civvies, and they tried to get back over the Jordan River, which was much wider then than it is now. The uh, Manassites have uh, taken the fords, and they can't get across. So as these folks come up there from Ephraim, uh, they're asked a question. Uh, Are you an Ephraimite? No, I'm not an Ephraimite. Well, hey, then say to us, Shibboleth, putting that H in there, Shibboleth. But he could not say... Uh, properly, he said Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it correctly. And if you couldn't pronounce that H, 42,000 of them died there on the spot. Well, it just so happens that my favorite movie and favorite musical, My Fair Lady, contains something hitting on that very point. Professor Henry Huggins and Eliza Doolittle, he's trying to teach her how to pronounce her words properly. Say, repeat this after me, Eliza. In Hartford, Harrison, and Hampshire, hurricanes hardly ever happen. And she repeats, in Artford, Erfin, and Amter, 
hurricanes hardly ever happen. No, 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 he says. Hey, as a lawyer would say, that's a summary judgment. That's a dead giveaway. Manasseh, you're going to be a great nation, as per Genesis 48. Others want to be like you, and you're going to possess the gates of your enemies. And who is that Manasseh going to be? We'll get into that more in the next section. So in summary, the ten tribes of Israel, had they been lost? No, we have traced fact after fact after fact as to where they're migrating and moving. Only a few of them, comparatively speaking, were taken captive. M many, many more migrated to their colonies that they had established during the times of David and Solomon. And they were voluntary migrations as the Carthaginians, Iberians, Celts, the Danon Sea peoples, Milesians, the Scythians. Now, there was com uh, a captivity, but that was only of a relatively uh, few Israelites by the Assyrians, who later became known as uh, Scythians and Parthians. The names, they take on new names and identities. Saxons, Germanic tribes, Goths, Teutonic tribes, Jutes, Alans, Vandals, Danes, Franks, Normans, Norsemen, and Vikings. And then our next part, we will look at two of the more modern tribes, Manasseh and Reuben. And I think it's very easy to spot Manasseh and Reuben and see who they were in the latter days. And if we want to keep this in mind as we consider this fact. If you are an Israelite, physically, that's great. That's tremendous to know who we are and it affects our understanding of the Bible tremendously. But the real Israelite, the real key is to be one spiritually. And we become a spiritual Israelite when we accept Yahshua into our life, we give Yahshua our life, He takes us, we become united with Him, we become, as uh, uh, Second Corinthians says, a new creature in Him. And that's what really counts uh, for the eternal, everlasting kingdom of our wonderful High King of Heaven. Thank you. Next time we'll wrap this all up in the four-part series of the Lost Tribes of Israel. And I think it is very important that we understand who we are, but uh, even more importantly, as Roger has mentioned, that we do the things that are needed to become part of uh, and be a part of the spiritual. Uh, and the, that is very important. We need to look up rather than down.